Brother Claude, would you hold for a prayer, please? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to give us to come to your house this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings, Lord. Your yes. souls are bumping upon us. I'm more than unfit, Lord, to do it by that precious blood of Jesus. Father, we have access to the Holy of Holies this morning. We thank you, Lord, for that great privilege and honor that you bestowed upon us. Lord, we ask this morning that you bless your service. We ask that you bless the Lord as he brings a message to us. Lord, we ask that you help us to have our minds open, our minds that our understanding. Father, help us to let these words from that book soak into our minds and our hearts, Lord. Let us live according to that precious word in that book, Lord. Father, we ask this morning that you remember those in the nursing home and the hospital, those in the homebound and the head, ask you to touch and encourage them more than strength. <coughs> Father, we ask that you remember those, Lord, that the hand of death has touched the family, Lord, we ask that you touch them, Lord. Let them know, Lord, that there's, after this life's over, Lord, there's a better place to be, Lord, that Jesus Christ has made that possible for all of us. Father, we ask that you touch us. Help us to be the ones that spread that gospel of Jesus to the lost and dying world. Father, help us to stand up and hold that blood stand in the of time, Father. Lord, we ask this morning that you help us here this morning to worship you and see yes. the truth. Yes. Father, we ask that you help us along life's journey, Lord, when the claim is overtake us. Father, we know that there's peace in you, Lord. Help us to lean on you, Lord, in everything that we do. We ask, we ask your presence in everything about our life, Lord. Help us all of okay. our life and our work, daily work, Lord. Whatever we're doing, we ask, Lord, that you stir our minds up, Lord, to keep you in, in, our, in our hearts so that if the occasion comes, meet one as long as Lord, we can say something that might encourage him. Father, as we come to you this morning, Father, we cast your care upon you, Father, and we ask, Lord, that you help us to be the people you have us to be. For it's in that precious name, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that I pray and ask these things this morning. Amen. <laughs>
he will be at my side. That same grace that's been my comfort and stay shall be much sweeter at the end of the way. Yeah.
I sang last Sunday at the church where I was scheduled, and my voice is messed up. Bad sound like a bull with his tail caught in a gate. <laughs> and I said, I'm not going to put those dear people through that this morning. So uh, we'll, we'll try to do better next time. Uh, I'm going to be in Psalm 139. You want to turn your Bibles there. But I tell you, i got a long commercial before I get there with you. I'm coming along. But uh, thank you for your support, your regular support uh, to us as your missionary. And uh, I'm just going to give you just a quick scan of some of the things we've been doing here over the last month. And uh, we, we, we did a mission trip out west uh, to the missionary retreat at the warehouse, Western Baptist Mission Warehouse, which you're very familiar with. Those of you who've known us for a while, you know that we support that as one of our uh, flagship projects. We spend a lot of time raising money for that warehouse because it supports missionaries, and these missionaries are in a nine-state radius around Wyoming. The warehouse is in Gillette, and uh, the missionaries that are trying to start good Bible-believing churches can come to this warehouse and get supplies that they need to continue the work that they that God's called them to do on the mission field there in the northern plain states. Now that's that's a hard area to survive in. Honestly, it is. Uh, that's one of the last, aside from Alaska, the northern plain states is one of the last hard fields as far as physics, uh, physical survival, uh, left in the United States. About everything's got heat and air conditioning. But I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of places out there that heat and air conditioning won't do you much good anyway. Um, and I don't have time to tell you, but there's, uh, you, you get that uh, cold front coming down east to the Rockies. It's an amazing thing. You go across the Rockies, the other side of the Rockies, into the Cascade Mountains, and it's, it's nothing but rain and mud over there. But that Canadian cold front coming down in front of the Rockies there on the east side, I'm going to tell you what, it will freeze your whiskers. <laughs> it, it, it's just amazing how cold it gets and how deep the snow gets. In the month of April, a good friend of mine who's on the uh, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, Brother Ken Trivet, he texted me. He said, I need you to come out here and, and help me to, for just a little while. i got a job to do. Now, again, this is April, four foot of snow on the ground, okay? So that's the kind of things they're dealing with out there. It'll get 22 below and stay there for weeks at a time. And so, you know, you just need help, physical help, when you're trying to stay in an atmosphere like that. Uh, high cost of living's there. They can't grow anything. Uh, they grow grass, and, and that very, very carefully. Uh, they grow cows. Uh, they mine in the, uh, they have uh, coal mines and so forth and so on, but they don't grow anything. So everything that you buy at the store, as far as produce, that sort of thing, is going to be higher. And so it's high cost of living out there. And then isolation, uh, a lot of a lot of miles between you and the next missionary, and so uh, and, and or Walmart for that matter. You may be you may be uh, you may be 100 miles from the closest Walmart. Uh, my friend, as I mentioned to you on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, of course, Brother, uh, uh, Brother Brad. I know you all have a bus route here, and uh, but I don't know how many miles it is. His is a 140 mile bus route. Okay. Um, I used to go out and complain when I was uh, uh, in the bus ministry in Indianapolis, Indiana. I'd get home at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and I'd miss my Baptist nap. You know, that makes people grouchy. <laughs> and so anyway, uh, but Brother Ken Trimmett don't get home until 4.30 in the afternoon. 140 mile bus route on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Everything you can do out there costs more and takes longer. And so again, that's the reason for the warehouse. And so the warehouse is doing good. We, we attended a warehouse retreat in the beginning week of June. There were 11 missionary families present, and the retreat is strictly for missionary families. We can get them in the warehouse, preach to them, sing to them, get them fired back up, and fill whatever vehicle they got up with the things they need to take back, whether it's something for the church, whether it's something for them personally. They can get some food. They can get some Bibles. They can get whatever's in the warehouse there that they might be able to use. Maybe it's a piano. Maybe it's whatever's there. They're, it's welcome to No charge to the missionary. So that's what we do. I'm way behind. <clears throat> I'm way behind in raising funds for that. I'm, I'm soliciting 25 churches. I've got two. But I need 25 churches in the next uh, few days. <laughs> weeks. Well, I'll take weeks if I get it. Uh, to do at least one 
pallet of supplies for the warehouse. They're $300 each, and uh, if the church can do more, nobody would write them a nasty letter. I promise you. Amen. <laughs> but uh, about $300 a pallet, and we're trying to get 25 churches. Uh, also, I want to share with you that I, I went to uh, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, and I'll bring that subject up one more time, to help a new ministry get started, which you're familiar with. Uh, <clears throat> Samaritan Smiles is a ministry that's started by my daughter-in-law and son, Nicole and uh, Cole Barnett. And by the way, we're involved in everything. I mean, she mentioned my daughter. Uh, we just got three or four different things. A lady was talking to my wife on Facebook the other day, and uh, she said, uh, I wish to my goodness that those Barnetts would try and find something to do for God. <laughs> well, we're involved in so many different things. I don't know. It's just our nature. We well, just cool. enjoy doing it. But uh, anyway, my, my daughter-in-law is a dentist. And so that was the reason that she decided to get into the medical profession is because she wanted to do mission work, medical missions. And so I said, well, they had one trip under their belt to Belize, and uh, they were not happy with that trip because there was no gospel witness as a result of their goal. It was just a league of dentists that went there to do the right thing. There's nothing wrong with what they did, but it did not promote the gospel that my daughter-in-law and son wants uh, to be promoted as a result of their gift. And so I said, well, we'll take you on one that the gospel will be presented. So we went to the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation I don't have time to tell you all of the things that the devil fought, but I'm going to tell you, we got into a hornet's nest from start to finish on that particular project. But we were able to see 19 people out there, free of charge, my daughter-in-law and son. He's her, that's, that's one time where she usurps authority over my son. He's her assistant. And so she's, she's a dentist, and they saw 19 people there. And they helped a lot of folks who otherwise Amen. would not have had any help That's good. with their dentist uh, needs whatsoever. At the end, I preached the gospel to these people. They came back to the church. Uh, I would love to tell you, and we had in our dreams that many people would be saved. But I'm going to tell you, there's a spirit on an Indian reservation that you may not be ready for. See, when you march in there and you tell them the things that you're doing for them, are not in the name of a witch doctor or not in the name of the medicine man. Those people are still real today. Okay? They, they are on every reservation. And you tell them that what you're doing is in the name of Jesus and he did that for them. Then you stir up the underworld and you stir up all kinds of opposition from that, that area in your life. And again, I don't have time to tell you where all that went wrong and, and even the planning of this of this trip. But God God God's going to get the glory. Amen. I preached Amen. that Sunday, the altars were filled. I thought everybody was getting saved, Brother Brad. I said that what we what we envisioned is happening here. So I got down, I started walking back and forth among the people. What can I pray with you about today? I'm praying for so and so. He's sitting back there, he's lost. Mm. I'm praying for Jesus to come. See when you live on a reservation like Pine Ridge. People starve to death, freeze to death on that reservation. Okay? Poorest county, it was three years ago, poorest county in the nation. Okay? You pray for Jesus to come back. A lot of these people were praying for Jesus to come back when they came to the altar. Because they had enough. They, there's not any way out for some of those people. Yeah. And so, uh, but nobody came to be saved. And but I sensed as I preached, and Brother Brad, you know what I'm talking about. You can sense when the Holy Spirit is really <coughs> pungent. And he's dealing with hearts. And there were people back there, I could tell. The, the face of conviction was on them. But they nobody came. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know what God, I don't know what God was wanting to accomplish altogether, but I do, I do know one thing God accomplished. He gave my children, he gave Coal and the coal and appetite to go back because Amen. they didn't see what they wanted to see. Amen. So they're going to be doing another trip. Don't know when. That was an expensive endeavor. Bless uh, like I said, early in the year, I spent a lot of time raising money for that trip. 
and I've kind of got behind on my warehouse project, and so now we're playing catch up on that. Uh, but but their next one, I'll tell you their next one is going to be in Chicago, uh, in one of the underserved areas of Chicago. I think that's going to happen in the month of September. So you pray for Samaritan smiles. And uh, then also I'm going to say this and I'm going to preach because I've got a lot to get done by the time I get you out here at 2 o'clock today. <laughs> preach, brother. One guy, one guy, one guy over there, the other day, he got up and, and started walking out. And I said, well, where are you going? He said, I'm going to get a haircut. I said, well, you should have got that before you got in here. He said, I didn't need one. <laughs> <laughs> I've got you fully convinced I'm a long-winded preacher. I promise when I get into the Word in a few minutes, I'll be done as soon as I can get done. Amen? Amen. But pray for my wife. Um, Amen. Many of you know her history 20 years ago. Uh, we dealt with cancer, full-blown radiation, full-blown chemotherapy. And a lot of people don't Honestly, they may not make it far enough along to find out what the residual effects of, of certain types of chemotherapy are, so on and so forth. My wife is dealing with a lot of that now. Um, more tumors, they're benign, but she's, you know, tumor in the back. Now she's, she's got two rods, five screws in the spine, a tumor in the thyroid um, that's been removed, um, benign. Um, she, uh, it'd be easy for me to tell you what my wife don't have, but she now has uh, venous reflux, reflux in her legs. That's where the blood pools up in her legs. And uh, it, it, if she's up on her legs 30 minutes, they swell really bad. So pray for her. And, uh, and I'm not supposed to tell you this because she's not advertising it, but I don't always do what my wife says, but you've got to keep a secret. My okay. We were at the eye doctor the other day, and she has the beginnings of macular degeneration. So that means we don't know how fast it's going to progress, but her eyesight is beginning to fade. So, so pray for my wife. Amen. And she don't travel well. She don't travel well, and I, she's better off at the home church. And so most of my travels these days are solo. Mm -hmm. so, Pray for me. It's it's not easy. It's not easy. And I'm not I'm not crying a sad song because God is good. Amen. Amen. God gives you strength. The devil will tell you every morning when you wake up that every last thing is wrong. And the best thing for you to do is pull the covers back up over your head and live in the darkness of depression and everything else, like so many have fallen into that trap. But I'm telling you, you get up and you put your feet on the floor and you beg God for the, for the mercies of that morning and you know there's light and energy that comes from that. Amen. Yes. And the next thing you know, you get to stirring around and dealing with some of the issues. You find out that every last thing is not wrong. There's only a few minor details that's out of alignment. That's right. He's a deceiver. Yeah, amen. John 8, 44 says he's a liar and the father of it. I'm going to tell you, that's how he wins over you. That's how he wins over me. It's through deception more than anything else. He don't have to assign a demon or an imp to us. He gets the job done by just telling us a lie in our spirit. He deals with us in our conscience. And so I'm, going to hear, I'm here to tell you every last thing is not wrong in your life. There's just a few details that are misaligned. And if you'll start stirring around and doing something about it, you'll be surprised what God will honor. That's right. He'll give you strength and energy, and He'll give you light. Yeah. He'll give you a bright spirit right. instead of an old, deep, dark uh, opposition uh, towards the things of this world we call depression. A lot of people in ministry are stricken with it. Well, that's another message. i got to get to Psalm 139. If you got a question, about the ministry, ask me after service. I really want to answer it. And I'm, 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 but if I, if I open up for questions now, it might delay us. And I, need, I do need to be out of here before you guys. Uh, uh, I, I know Baptists want to beat the Presbyterians to the steakhouse. And you get grouchy if you don't. So we've got to get you out of here. Psalm 139, we're going to read 
begin to read verse number 13. If you will, stand with me. You've been sitting for a little while. 139, verse number 13, and David's speaking here. He said, For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. He's talking from the perspective of before he was born. Okay? I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Verse number 13, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great! is the sum of them. Let's pray. Father, help us this morning. Touch our hearts with what you laid upon our hearts to speak. And Lord, cleanse us today. At altar call, Lord, may you send the, those of us forward that need to be clean and things that might be uh, standing between us. That these people could walk in power and in light. And that people could get to know Christ as a result of their being here on this earth. Lord, I love you. Thank you for the strength that you've given for this hour in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. Verse number 17, I'm going to read it to you again. How precious, David said, also are thy thoughts unto me. How precious are the thoughts of God. David was one of the most powerful. David was one of the most talented. David was one of the most blessed men that ever walked the face of this earth. Why was that? He has this trait in common with anyone else that had those attributes. Mm -hmm. He simply cared what God thought. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. That's the missing ingredients in the lives of a lot of people today that wonder why they're spinning their wheels. They simply care what God thinks. Those people who, who succeed in life, and I'm not saying that if you care what God thinks is going to make you a billionaire. We always go to the cash. We go to the cash. Or follow the money is the expression. We always think that richness in material goods is what God's blessing is. No, 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 no. And I don't have time to preach that message because that's, that's another avenue of thought. But this morning I want, to, I want to share with you that God was a big deal to David. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, if you want God's blessing on your life, if you want peace, if you want contentment, yeah, if you God. want what God wants for you, that's, you'll care what He thinks, yeah. and you'll pay attention to His words. Amen. Amen. We have to look at this book as something here more than, this This Bible here is something more than just a book. Yeah. Right. Amen. This is God's Word. This right. is God's plan for our life. And you say, well, I've had a thousand preachers tell me that. Well, you've got a thousand and one now. It's right. We cannot change the truth for sake of convenience. I'm telling you, this is the way it is. Amen. The yeah. Bible is the bottom line. Amen. Right. Amen. Now, let's don't add to it. Right. right. There's a lot of preachers out there get a mean spirit. They try to make a new Bible of their own. Yeah put a bunch of codes and so forth in a, a little book they carry in the, the back of, you know, I don't know, somewhere. It's the Code of Independent Fundamentalism. That's right. <laughs> it's adding to the Bible some things that's not even there. Let's don't make the Christian life so hard nobody can live it. Amen. Yeah. My goodness, let's just get in the Bible, preach what the Bible said, and leave right. it alone. Amen. 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 I want to talk to you about Big deals. Life's big deals. There are, there are areas in our life we all consider to be big deals. Mm -hmm. God was a big deal to David. Yeah. But I want to say something else. David was a big deal to God. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Here's the first big deal I want to talk to you about. You're a rival to this world. That's a big deal. It was a big deal to everybody around you. It's a big deal to your mother and your father. They made plans. They made preparation for it. It's 
far superior to any of the other big deals in their life. You know, your dad and your mom, they remember their first day of school. I remember my first day of school. I remember better my last day of school, which was a lot better than the first day of school. For me, a lot of you people love school. I was different. Raised on the farm, running everywhere. I didn't like anything that could find me behind four walls. But that's just me. So I like the last day of school. I remember, I remember the birth of my children above most things in my life. Big deal. I remember when my wife was expecting with Corey, our daughter, she was our first. I was doing poor concrete that day. And she wasn't supposed to come until a couple of days later. So my buddy said, we're going to pour concrete over my garage, you know. So I said, okay, well, I may be. So I, was get, I got in the truck, and we were backing out of the driveway, and Vicki raised up the window, and she said, come here a minute. Come here, i got to talk to you. So I went up to the window. She had her head stuck out the window, and she said, I'm having a baby. <laughs> I said, uh, you sure about this? She said, I'm sure. I said, hey, Bob. I said, my wife's having a baby. She can't be talked out of it. I said, uh, you're going to be pouring concrete by yourself. Why? Because it's a big deal. Huh. Big yeah. deal. Yeah. Your arrival to this world was a big deal. And not only a big deal to your mother and your father, but a big deal to everybody around you as well. Your uncles and your aunts and, and even the neighbor. I mean, you get the attention of a lot of people when you come into this world. But let me share something else with you. You're a big deal to God. In 1953, I started a ride. It was, to begin with, it was the, the work of the flesh. My mother and father had that relationship, that intimate relationship, and then the natural birth process uh, ensued after that, and for nine months, it was, it was the work of the flesh. But there came a point where instead of it being the natural birth process, it was God's intervention that came in. And it was it's what David was talking about right here. God knew me before I even got to that point. But at, at some place while I was in my mother's room, and I don't know why, I, I can't figure out when that happened. But God himself came on the scene and he breathed into my nostrils the breath of life. Amen. That had nothing to do with my mother or my father because my soul and your soul is eternal. That has to be Amen. given by God. Amen. He yeah. gave you an eternal soul. Amen. Amen. You're a big deal to God. Yeah. Why? Why? Because at that point, he knew that you were a sinner. Are you hearing me? You think about this. At that point, God knew you were guilty already because you were the bloodline of sin itself. You had no divine blood in you. Your mother and father had conceived and she was burying you at that point. And you had the bloodlines of a mother and a father that were both sinners. You had no hope of being righteous. At that point, but he still breathed the breath of life into you. God not only knew that you were a sinner, and you get this real good, and you'll understand why you're a big deal to God. He also knew that you didn't ask to be a sinner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Think about that. At that very moment that he breathed the, the, the eternal soul into you, he knew that you did not ask to be a sinner. And that's where mercy and grace come into the picture. Yeah. That's why God seeks you. That's why the Holy Spirit has spoken to you more than once concerning your soul. Some of you are saved. 
I can remember back when I was saved, God had spoken to me innumerable times about my lost state. Why? Because he knew he had breathed the breath of life into me, one that was guilty, but had not asked for that guilt. So God feels a necessary obligation to us. That's why, my friend, he is after you every day if you have never been saved to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Yeah. Every day, every day, he seeks a way into you that you might come to the, to the knowledge of your sin and to the knowledge of the Savior that he has, he has sent to save you from that sin. You're a big deal to God. Now, you're also, you're, another big deal in your life is your first encounter with God. Through a preacher or through life situations, God speaks to you through His Spirit. He doesn't walk up to you in body. In body, God's a spirit. But through His Spirit, He speaks to you in one way or another. It may be that God spoke to you the first time through a preacher. Uh, we're accustomed to that, and I'll tell you why. And a lot of people think it can't happen any other way. But I'm going to refute that. The reason why we think it can't happen any other way is because we have created an environment here in the United States of America of, of Christianity. That's the reason this nation was formed in the beginning, is that people could come and, and believe the way they wanted to believe. So we immediately began to build churches, didn't we? We built churches. We built a controlled atmosphere. We put seats in those churches. We put a pulpit in those churches. We put a prayer altar in those churches. And we have had the convenience of that for centuries right here in the United States of America. And we think, because generations have came up through that, that that's just the way that you get saved. Is you hear a preacher preach. Yeah. And that's the way some do get saved. You hear that and the Spirit of God speaks to you just like my voice is coming. He, he uses that and you walk the aisle and you get saved in an altar of prayer in a church. I mean, I've talked with people about being saved. They say, well, I just can't get down to the church right now. Well, it don't make no difference when you right. get down to the church. Right. Right. We got to do something that's, that's much, much higher than that. Yeah. Amen. We got to get you in touch with God. Yes, amen. Yeah. And sometimes in order for God to get in touch with people, He has left to no other choice but to use the unusual. I ask, I don't some of you may know, you, you probably know, you know Brother Jim Gambrell. Yeah, brother, he was a member there at Brother Oral Duncan's for a lot of years. Brother Jim's a pretty big tall guy. Yeah. He used to be a bouncer in a bar. Right. We drove a truck. And I'm attracted to guys like that, you know. We generally find a thing to talk about. Brother Tim and I, we, we become very close track, uh, close friends. And, and uh, I said, well, Brother Jim, I said, uh, how'd you get saved? And he said, well, preacher, he said, I'll tell you. He said, if I, if I told you how I got saved, you'd probably think I was still lost. I said, well, try me. He said, well, he said, I was bouncing in a bar one night. And he said, uh, there was a guy playing a guitar on the stage that I'd never heard anybody play so good in all my life. And he said, I've got to talk to this guy. And he said, I, I, and so I'm, I invited him over to my table. And he said, I got to talk to him a little bit. I complimented him on his ability on the instrument. And he said, we got to chatting for a little bit. And then I got, he said, all of a sudden, that guy's face went blank. He looked me right eyeball to eyeball. And he said, I should not be here. Hmm. And it, he, Jim said, it kind of threw me back. He said, why are you saying it? He said, I should not be here. He said, I used to use my talent in church. Hmm. 
And he said, I served God many years, but he says, I've gotten away from that. And he says, there's people in my family that's praying for me right now. And he says, I'm, I'm under conviction. And he said, my dear mama and my grandma, and, he, and Jim said, when he said grandma, he said, it got a hold of my heartstrings. He said, because I, because I knew my grandma had been praying for me. Amen. And he said, I feel underneath conviction. Oh, yeah. You won't find that in that code book that I was talking about. No, yeah. Yeah. no according to that code book, that couldn't happen. Right. But he said, I went home and he said, I, I, I just walked in conviction for a long time. And he said, I finally went to church with my grandma. And he said, I went down the aisle and he got saved. Amen. And he raised his family for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And the fruits to bear it. The unusual. God works. I remember my first encounter. I was saved at 21 years old. But my first encounter was in my living room in East Tennessee. I was about five years old. My father was a poor sharecropper. He was of a Scot-Irish heritage, and a lot of people may not understand this, but I do. When the Scot-Irish people moved to the Appalachian Mountains, they brought their banjos, they brought their guitars, they brought their fiddles, and they also brought their stills. Mm. It was a very prideful thing. They knew how to make liquor, and they knew how to make it well. And my daddy came from a long line of people that was given to strong drink. Mm. Now, you've heard of crack babies. You've heard of babies that are addicted to drugs when they come out of the womb. Now tell me one good reason why that can't work in other ways. My dad was an alcoholic from the womb. He just took his first drink and, and got a kick start. And my dad was a good man. He didn't beat his wife up. He treated his kids good. He worked hard. But he was addicted to alcohol. My daddy knew it was wrong. And my daddy would call people up, not call, we didn't have telephones. That's back in the days you didn't have a telephone. And my dad would, would physically go to the doors of people that he knew, knew how to get in touch with God, knew how to pray, and he would invite them to our house that he could somehow get rid of this addiction. He would invite them to come and pray. And I remember sitting over in the living room of our old house. And those old prayer words would come in there and they'd kneel at my father's chair. And he'd be sitting there. They'd be praying for him. God deliver him from the evils. But while they was praying for him, it eclipsed on me. Man. And God began to show me that I had some evils. You know, we're created with a moral compass. We're created with the, the, the knowledge of God according to Romans chapter number 1. But we're also instinctively endowed with a moral compass. We may not understand everything that's right and wrong, but we know as we begin to grow and understand with years of knowledge, we begin to understand there is a right and wrong. And the longer we go, the more we understand the basics of right and wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And at five years old, I knew there was something wrong with me. Because I didn't always do what my mommy and daddy told me to do. And the Spirit of God began to work with my heart at five years yeah. old. That was my first encounter. I don't know when you had your first encounter. But I'm here to tell you, that's a big deal. It may be that God may be dealing with some of you for the first time here. I don't know. If 
he is, it's a big deal. That's right. Your first encounter with God. And may I share with you, this is the last point I'll make. Your departure from this world. Yes. It's a big deal. Yeah. Bye. The direction you're going on the day that you leave here cannot be reversed. That's right. It's irreversible. It's the biggest of all the big deals, your departure from this earth, because it's for keeps. Yeah. Remember, we used to play marbles when was growing up. Sometimes we played for fun. Sometimes we played for keeps. If you played for keeps, you got serious for the bread. Yeah. You didn't bring marbles to school if they were playing for keeps that you wanted to get rid of. You only brought the old ugly ones. Yeah. But you took very careful inspection of everything that you put inside that circle. I want to share with you something. The day that you leave here, you better take a close, close look what's inside that circle because yeah. it's for keeps it's born unto man wants to die and after this the judgment that's right. yeah. and I'm here for you. the last thing that God wants to do is judge you I, raised, I was raised up among preachers, and I'm grateful for what they said because they said it in, in the best of understanding and learning that they had. But they preached on hell every service, and they preached like everybody was going there who were the saved. They preached the good on hell, and it's like they were born and raised there. But I found out that God is my joy. That's right. And people going to hell. Right. Amen. That's why the mercies of God are new to us every yes, morning. Thank you. Thank you. God knew when He breathed into your your little body the breath of life that give you an eternal soul. The sun, the moon, and the stars, if they ever burn out, if God would allow them to burn out, your soul will still be burning after they're long gone. I'm telling you, your soul will live forever somewhere. Yeah. It is God's utmost desire Amen. that it not be spent in a place called hell. It is God's utmost desire that it be spent in heaven with the rest of the saints of God that have gone on before us and the angels praising and worshiping Him. He said, but I just don't know if I want to go there. I just don't know if I'd like that or not. Well, that's a sheer sign. You're probably not saved because the Spirit of God's not bearing witness with you right now. Listen to me. When you get to heaven, you're going to like whatever's going on. Amen. It's going to be good. Thank you, Lord. You won't miss it. And I'll add this. Even if you were sitting in a dark corner and nobody ever spoke a word to you for the rest of eternity, which is not going to happen, you'd be a whole lot better off there than the alternative. Yeah. yeah. Amen. You don't want none of that. That's right. It was not intended for you. But as long as we retain sin, as long as we remain sinful people and will not get that sin forgiven through the, the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, God has no choice. He cannot invite sin into heaven. He's, he is routing this thing to straighten it out, not, not do a rerun of what we've already done here. He wants there to be a new heaven and a new earth. And He don't want sin to be a part of it. And you and I are going to have to get the forgiveness of sin through Jesus Christ. Yes. And then we can enter in. Thank you. Then we can enter in. And we'll be a citizen of heaven. Amen. The departure from this world, Charles Spurgeon said this, 
He speaks to the Christian. He said, depend on it. He said, your dying hour will be the best hour. The best hour you've ever known. Your last moment will be the richest moment. Better than the day of your birth will be the day of your death. That's just warped in the, in the sight of this world. Dying's better than living? Oh, yeah, it is to the person who knows where they're going and what awaits them. Amen. 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 We may be <laughs> suffering in body, but that moment, I mean, I realize Christians suffer at their death. Many of them burned alive and everybody. Boy, I'm telling you, at that moment when that soul that God instilled in your body separates and I'm telling you, there's, there's going to be the angels that take you away and all of a sudden, you, you'll be looking from a bird's eye view what was going on there and all of a sudden, there'll be a release and the next thing you know, you'll be in the presence. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. That'll be the best moment. <laughs> I'm telling you, he made certain galaxies. There's over a million galaxies out there, Brother Brad's, and they've never been seen even through the Hubble telescope. And I'm convinced the only reason God made them is so that you and I, when we wisp out of this world on our way to heaven, could catch a glimpse of them. Yeah. Hey, Amen. We'll get to see them. No human eyes ever laid eyes on them. But the people that are called to be before God have seen them on their way out. Oh yeah, you'll see the Milky Way. You'll see all that, but you'll see a lot more as you slip through the outer space between here and heaven. Nobody knows where it is. But there is a fixed place on the sides of the north, the Bible says. He says, It shall be the beginning of heaven, the rising of the sun that shall go down no more forever. There will be no more sunsets. Yeah. Everything will be fresh and new. And nothing ever grows old. Amen. We don't have time to get into that. But Jesus is all you need yeah. to get there. Amen. 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 May I say it this way? Jesus is all you can have. God grew the line. You can't get it any other way. Amen. We can try to add to it. We can try to make it hard. We can crawl on glass. We can cut ourselves with knives. It won't. It avails nothing. You can't add to the salvation plan that God has given you. You can't take away from it. It's, it's the way it is. And if we come yeah, to man. heaven, it will, we will come by the way of Jesus Christ. Right. That's the way it is. He died for you. He lived, he lived the life you could not live. He gave that supreme sacrifice on the cross of Calvary on your behalf. He paid the price in full for you. That's right. yeah. You say it's too good to be true. I'm going to tell you, it is too good. But it is true. It, it's far better than we deserve. It's yeah, too good. That's right. But it is true. Yeah. It's true. You say, well, I just think you ought to have to do something. Well, you study out this Bible. You see what God renders to us in the way of what heaven holds for us. What are you going to do to earn that? What are you going to achieve that would earn the likes of that? You can't do it. No. You really won't know the fullness of needing Christ until you come down to life's end and He's all you have. We'll come to that. I've watched people, many people come to it. And I watched them in the moments just before they leave out of here and they come to realize that the things that they've done, the only thing they can say is, I, I hope it was good enough. That's all they can say. The only people that are sure about this thing, the only people who are at peace about this thing when they leave here, are the ones that says, I trust in Him. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I trust in Christ. But the, te the devil will tell you it's not necessary. The devil will tell you that you need other things. But he's a liar. Mm. He'll say there's no more help, there's no more hope, there's no more happiness in this life. 
I had a friend in high school, and he got convinced of that. It was just a little thing that was out of alignment. His girlfriend had called him up and told him she didn't want to go with him anymore. And he thought it was worth going out in the back of that old 1962 Chevy car that I'd worked on many a time with him and putting an end to his life. Hmm. Not supposed to end that way. Man. Not supposed to end that way. should end in victory. Yes. Mm. In Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And what you need today is what he has to offer. Amen. You need to pray a prayer that says, Lord, be merciful. If you haven't already, some of you have. Some of you have Christ. You've had him for years. That's why you're here. You're being, you're being faithful Christians. I'm Christians. I'm glad for you. And you know what I'm talking about. But there may be somebody here today needs to say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I'm going down the wrong road. Oh, by the way, it could be a church member. Mm -hmm. I was a church member. Told you I grew up in a house, mom and dad, they knew what church was about, they took me to church. Mm -hmm. And to appease them, I did what they told me to do. I was a church member. Live two different lives. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Whether I'm a church member or not, be merciful to me, a sinner. I'm walking down the wrong road. I need you to forgive me. I want to go to heaven. I invite you into my heart and life. Some people want Jesus, but they don't. They, they, some people want what Jesus has to offer, but they don't want Him. That's right. It doesn't work that way. That's right. I invite you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, but I invite you into my heart and into my life. Amen. I don't want just what you have to offer. Yeah. I want you. Yes. Amen. And let me speak from experience. He's not... He is not a, a taskmaster. When you invite Jesus into your heart and your life, those same mercies that were new to you before you were saved are still new to you after you're saved. Right. And you're going to fail. You're going to do things that are not right. And you'll depend on those mercies as you grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You'll depend on those mercies for the forgiveness even after you're saved. But you've invited Jesus into your heart and your life to help you. Yes, amen. And the main thing is you have been forgiven for your sins. Yeah. And you are positionally holy. Yeah, that's right. Mm. You've been positioned in a place of holiness. You are seated. You have a seat in heavenly places. No, you can't mess that up. You can't take that out. But then God begins to work in you the work that we call sanctification back here on earth. And you begin to work practical holiness out in your life. And you begin to grow and learn and do the things that God wants you to do right here on earth. But there's positional holiness that you get when you get saved. That's in heaven. You're a citizen there. Your yeah, name is man. on the roll. Then God works on your life here on this earth as you walk it out here. This morning I'll give you everything I feel like I have time to give you. My main goal this morning is to see someone get saved who's not saved. If you're not, you need to come to this altar this morning. Yeah. Today Amen. is the day of salvation. Yeah. Brother, Brother Endel said, you make yourself ready for the invitation. I'll take just a little bit, sister. If you'll just play whatever we, the Lord lays on your heart this morning. I want you to bow your heads with me.
Father, I pray that you move in a special way in the lives of the subject here this morning. Many are saved. I'm convinced of that. Many people already know the Lord Jesus. But Lord, there may be some here without Christ. I pray, Lord, if that be the case, that they would find their way to this altar this morning. They would, they would come down and talk to us, Lord. We might be able to share with them from the Bible how they would get their sins taken care of. Now, Father, I pray that you be with the Christians today. Some may need to come and just renew some of the things, Lord, that they've been slack in. Whatever the case is, dear God, I pray that you take care of it in the hearts and the lives of your people this morning as we have this invitational number. In the precious name of Christ, we pray. No one's head to raise. No one's head to raise. No one's eyes to open for just a moment. How many of you say this morning, I know, I know, I know. Don't, don't toy with this. This is serious. This is serious. I know beyond the shadow of doubt, if I face God this next moment, I have the blood of Christ on my sins. Can I see your hand? I have the blood of Christ on my sins. Yes, thank you. You may put your hands down. Some couldn't raise their hand. How many of you say this morning, if I pass from this life into the next, right now, I'm not sure if I would meet God's standards of forgiveness. Here's my hand. I'm not sure if I'd face God prepared or not. Here's my hand. Anyone pray for me? Anyone at all? Anyone at all? I'm not sure if I'd face God prepared. All right. Let me ask you this. Is there a Christian here this morning that say, Preacher, I have been taking God seriously. I've been following, but I've been following from afar. And to be honest, the reason I came here today is just because I knew I was supposed to. I didn't come out of a readiness and spirit. I just came out of obligation. My relationship with God is, is lacking. Preacher, could you remember me in prayers? Do I see a hand at all? Do I? Yes, I see that. Bless your heart. Thank you. Thank you for being honest. Anyone else? Pray for me. My, my, my relationship with God can certainly stand in improvement. Here's, here's my hand. Here's my hand. I see that. Thank you. Yes, I see that. Hands, hands are going up. People are being honest. Listen, I see that. Bless your heart. You're not confessing to me when you raise your hand. That's not my purpose. The reason you're raising your hand is so that you realize that there's something lacking. When you do that, you've told yourself, yep, there's something there that I need to attend to. While hands are still bowed and eyes are still closed before Brother Brad comes, those of you who lifted your hand, why don't you come on down to the altar here this morning? Don't let anything stop you. Just come on down. There's nobody here but us this morning. This is why you come to church. That's what this altar down here was built for. It's for God's people to come and use it. Why don't you just come while I'm, while I'm talking right now, while she's praying, while the heads are bowed, while eyes are closed. Why don't you just come on down and say, God, I'm here. I, I want to I wanna freshen up my relationship with you. Tend to this, Lord, in my spirit.
here in your house today, Lord. Lord, we pray that we'll take this message home with us, Lord. And Lord, we'll live the way you want us to live. And Lord, we know that you'll answer each and every prayer request that was lifted up to you here today, both spoken and unspoken. And Lord, we pray that you'll guide us back here at the next appointed time. Lord, we ask these things in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.